started taking seed from our own trees that were pollinated with those other good trees that were still left in that orchard and started planting down here. We bought uh, a dairy farm down here and started planting what we thought were our best trees down here to do what we call progeny tests. Because one of the problems with chestnuts, they do not graft very well, so that you can't plant, like an apple orchard, you can plant all Macintosh, you can plant, you know, Golden Delicious or Red Delicious or whatever you want to plant. With chestnuts, it's very difficult to plant grafted ones to do any good up in this kind of northern climate. So you're, you're relying on seedlings. But by the time I planted down here, using uh, seed from my orchard that had been so heavily culled, we found that we were planting them on seven foot in the row, seven by 20, and that was like way too close. There were so many, so many uh, good trees in there that we had to just, uh, you know, cull out stuff that was actually pretty good. And so we started making some money selling chestnuts, and we just continued to grow. We continue to do these progeny tests, and what that has allowed us to do is we know which trees are going to produce good seedlings as far as the nut production and the quality of the nuts and that kind of thing. We, we kept statistical um, tests of that going, and we're always testing new stuff. But when we plant up an orchard today, we'll plant a skeleton of an orchard. Every 40 foot, we'll put a row of something we know is going to do. And then in between, on the, on the rows in between, we'll put in something that we think is promising for one reason or another. And then we're continually testing, looking for, for better seed sources than what we're using today, even though the ones we're using today are making money. The other thing that we've gone to as well is uh, there are certain attributes that these chestnuts have that are extremely valuable. Like one of the problems that we have is, is oriental chestnut gall wasps which was introduced over here by mistake down in Byron, Georgia, uh, probably 30 years ago or longer. It actually got up into this area. It's a devastating pest and extremely hard, if not impossible, to control. But we, in all of our plantings here, we found a few trees that never get it. So they, they have some kind of resistance to that. We also found some that it's almost always on the leaf instead of the stem. When it's on the stem, it'll girdle that stem, and it can even kill the tree. But it definitely takes the productive productivity of the tree way down. So we kept track of that. Now, now we're doing controlled crosses where we'll take the parent that, that has that resistance and cross that with something that has a better nut. Or uh, a few years ago, we had a devastating freeze here that froze every single bud in that orchard up in there. And yet some of those trees still had a crop. And so that, that's valuable information because the buds in the chestnut that produce fruit are usually in the terminal buds. And if they get frozen, that's usually the end of your crop. But some trees, even those secondary buds, are still loaded with flowers. And so that's, that's one of those attributes that we can cross that, trees that have that attribute with trees that have gold loss resistance and come up with kind of a super tree. And when we do uh, statistical analyses of, of some of these trees, because we've kept records on these trees, some of them for 20 years, we find that we do have trees in that orchard that are eight standard deviations from the mean, which means that they're so different from the general population as far as their productivity and nut quality that it's almost like they came from another plant. And these are the trees that are getting this strange combination of really good genetics. And one of the reasons we're getting that here is that we've tried to include every species of chestnut in our planting here. And the, our philosophy on that is that they have brought in disease and pathogen, uh, pathogens and insect pests from all over the world into the United States over the last 50 years. And each one of these different species had to co-evolve with some of these pests. And just as an example, uh, when Japanese beetle came over, uh, Japanese beetle will eat every single leaf off an American chestnut tree. But if you have a Japanese chestnut, they don't even like it. Because that tree co-evolved with a Japanese beetle and developed defense against it. 
the American chestnut, on the other hand, uh, if you take uh, an American pest, would, a good example of that would be potato leaf hop, which is American pest. That is devastating on Chinese chestnut. It will cause all the leaves to curl. If any of you have Chinese chestnut, you've probably seen it. They hit in early June, and you'll see all the, all the new leaves all curl, and they hit brown and look terrible. And that takes away from it the ability to photosynthesize and produce good crops. The American chestnut is almost unaffected by that. And so, again, if you can get some of those American genetics mixed in with the Chinese, you'll get some trees that have resistance to these American uh, pests. And that's basically the, we're trying to keep up the gene uh, genetic diversity of, of our trees to the highest level possible. But we're still uh, kind of keeping track of these super trees that we have out there because those will be a game cha changer someday when they figure out a way to clone these things that's economically viable. You know, we'll, I, I probably have at least 50 to 100 trees out there that are better than any cultivar I have ever tried. So that we, we have some fantastic stuff out there, it's just reproducing it. But for right now, just planting seedlings, we've got that down to the point where you can make money doing that. And that, that's the bottom line on this. I've always wanted to, you know, I always thought that chestnuts and the other nut trees that we work with, you know, they've been almost ignored by the human race. Uh, you know, they're, God gave us those for a reason. Uh, there's all kinds of things we can do with them. Uh, we just haven't even tried. And I think, you know, what I want to see is, uh, you know, I want to see people trying that, and I think the key to it is to show people you can make money at it. Because if you take the example of the pecan tree, as soon as people saw that they could make money planting pecans, they planted thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of pecans. And pecans are now secure. It's almost biblical that, you know, man is like God. I mean, if, if, if that thing does not produce fruit for mankind, it will be eliminated. And I really believe that's happening. You can see it. So I think, you know, any of you that have some years on you can see what's happening. Out there. And I think, you know, if we can show people that they can make money growing some of these things, they will dedicate thousands of acres and the, the future of those, those plants will, will be secure with mankind. Right? So that, that's kind of the uh, philosophy that we, we live by here, at least at Winter Green Tree Farm. Um, I think after this is done, I, if, if any of you are interested, I'd like to take you for a little tour of the orchard. But we, we make our living off of uh, chestnuts. And, uh, I, I say chestnuts are our biggest income producer now. It, I mean, it surpassed Christmas trees a few years ago, and it's kept going. It takes a while to make money at chestnuts, about 12 years to break even on it. But it, it can be done, and it makes money once you get it going. You also have to have the right piece of land and uh, the right kind of microclimate in this part of Ohio. But if anybody has questions about that, I can, I can help you out with that. But um, I wanted to say this facility here, we're building to kind of handle the chestnuts from our orchards here. We have about 120 acres of them here on this farm. But we also, uh, an exciting thing is we've got some other people around this area that have decided to try chestnuts out. And so we have uh, one family that's got about five acres of them planted, another that has about 10 acres planted. And if if they're successful with this, they, they would have to go through what we went through to, with all the marketing and storage and the sorting and all that stuff. They can bring them down here to this, this facility and we can run them through give them a fair price for them and get them started in the business. And that, that's kind of what we're trying to do right now. I think that, that probably is a, eat up most of my time, but if there's any questions, I'd, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah? Bob, a couple things. Number one, you look at those, I mean, those young trees are really producing. Also, you have red, you have yellow, you have green. Yeah. The, uh, the, we, we've been kind of selecting for trees that bear early because uh, if you buy land for eight or ten thousand dollars an acre, you need to get your money back pretty quick. And so uh, that's part of our breeding program is to try and get trees that produce faster 
and produce a bigger crop earlier in their life. Um, and as far as the different colors, uh, there's an interesting story with part of that, and that has that the, the woman who was in charge of the uh, chestnut uh, industry in China, uh, her name is Lu Lu, and she had heard that one of the emperors of China in the past had a, had a pink chestnut tree. And she's tried to track that down, and she actually found descendants of this tree that was in the history books. And she provided some seed from that tree to a friend of mine, Greg Miller, whose daughter is here somewhere, maybe, right over here. And Greg planted some of these out, and they, they had these pink burrs on them and pink leaves in the spring and fall. And then he also noticed, though, that they held up in storage almost better than any chestnut that he had. And that piqued my, my interest though, know, because the storage life is another thing that, that we're looking at. And so we, we have some of those out there. Some of them come true with that kind of pink color. Yeah. Greg's experience about taking the chestnut and making it non gluten, like pancakes, bakery items. Right? Any story on that? Yeah. Uh, yes, they, they are gluten free and they. Uh, for anybody that's uh, got celiac disease or has, has gluten intolerance, chestnuts is a great alternative. It, the flour, uh, because it doesn't have gluten and it doesn't rise, you have to you have to help it with that. It'll come up more like a cornbread kind of a thing. But it still it makes it makes a fine flour, and we we use it uh, at home in, in bread. Sometimes we put a little bit in, not too much. But it'll kill the, the rise on the on the bread, but. Uh, there, there are ways around that. I'm just not an expert bread maker, so I'm not sure exactly how to do that. But it really does enhance the flavor a lot, especially toasted. It's great. But you can also make beer with it. And you can make a gluten-free beer that's uh, fairly popular. And I think uh, that's, I know one guy that has 20 acres of chestnuts, and I think that's all they use the chestnuts for, is making a gluten-free beer. So, yeah? I know a long time, a while ago, you said, majority of your money was made by the pick your own. Are, has that changed a little bit? Uh, yes. Uh, the, I, I, I wouldn't say, I think uh, I probably said it wrong, but we make more money uh, per pound on the pick your own than anything else. Uh, we Up in the Cleveland area, there's a large Asian population and, and European population from areas where they, they grow a lot of chestnuts. And these folks are dying to get out and pick chestnuts. And they're willing to pay, they're, we charge $3.95 a pound for them to pick their own chestnuts. And they'll pick everything in, in the orchard out there. Uh, if, you have, if you're in an area where you've got like a Croatian community near you, ethnic Italian, uh, Bosnian, Serbian, Estonian, Lebanese, uh, yeah, Korean or Chinese, uh, you've got a made in shape. You don't even have to hire people to go pick chestnuts. You, you can just want to pick your own, and they'll probably pick anything that you've got. I even met a guy up in Michigan that has a farm where he lets people come pick their own and roast them right there. He charges six dollars a pound, or six or seven bucks a pound. He said he had a couple thousand people want to come do that. And this is up in Michigan. This isn't near a big city. Even they, they travel to do this kind of. And that, I don't think that just applies to chestnuts. I think people are willing to do stuff like that. I think you do it with hazelnuts. I think you could probably do it with pecan, you know, farmer with pecans, and probably even hickory nuts and that type of thing. Uh, so that, that opens up a whole another market uh, for these nuts. And I think, you know, the, the future is really bright, and, you know, for people that want to get into this. And I really think there's a lot of opportunity here. Yeah. So, Yes, we do. Yep. Uh, yeah, if you anybody's interested in seed chestnuts, we, we have them. Uh, some of the seed, that's going to be a, a big job for us doing the seed, but uh, we've got uh, Jesse Markson, I don't know if you've heard of him, but uh, he is going to collect a lot of our seed this year and then sell it uh, himself as kind of a different business. And I, I think that'll We've kind of got our hands full with some of the other stuff we're doing right now, so that I may farm some of that out to him. Yes. Is that uh, yes. Yeah. And what I'll do is uh, 
If Joe will remind me, I'll write a little article about that uh, for the nutshell. I will remind you. I know you will forget. <laughs> yeah. He's the editor of the nutshell, so he doesn't forget when someone promises to write an article. Yeah. I got a question. Yes. Oh, yeah. When you're selecting a location, what are a couple of things that you're looking for for a desirable location? What I look for is the, the best uh, well-drained upland soils. We said, in this part of the country, is booster so long and can field so long at a relatively high uh, elevation with good air drainage. So you either want to be uh, kind of on a, on a hillside with a little bit of slope but not too much, uh, or you can be on one of these hilltops as long as it isn't too flat. Uh, where we've got the chestnuts up here is one of the highest spots in the county. It's about, I think this entire farm up here, none of it's below 1,300 foot elevation. What that does, it, it gives you about an extra uh, maybe 40 days of growing season in this part of Ohio. It's the last place where the wind dies down. It keeps the air stirred up. And believe it or not, when you study frost and how that works, uh, when, when you get a Canadian high sitting over you in the springtime and it clears out, the, uh, the leaves radiate, radiate off heat into the great beyond out there. And they'll actually get colder than the air around them. The air doesn't radiate out heat like that. And so if you can keep the air moving at five miles an hour, it'll heat that, those leaves up, up, sometimes up to an extra five degrees which will get you through most of these frost episodes. That's one reason you want to be up on these high spots like this. And, you know, just because of that alone, like in, in Portage County, I think it buys me more time. Just to give you kind of an example of how this works and how microclimate works and how important it is. Ashton Beulah County right next to me up there in Portage County. Their claim to fame is they have the longest and the shortest growing season in the state of Ohio. If there's 70 days difference in growing season, just depending on where you have to land at. And it, so that, that becomes a real critical factor if you're trying to make money growing some of these trees, you really want to look into that kind of detail because you can't pull up and start over somewhere else. It's, it's kind of, and I've told a lot of people that a lot of people have a farm they want and grow chestnuts desperately. But sometimes you're better off just buying another piece of ground uh, because you're going to sink a lot of money into it. If anybody read that article in the nutshell that showed the break even on chestnuts, and I, I kind of we took one 25 acre orchard, kept track of the expenses when we actually broke even. By the time we got the worst part of it, we were like three hundred fifty thousand dollars in the hole on that 25 acres before it turned around. So if you're going to do this right, it's going to cost you a lot of money. But the returns are fantastic if you can weather the storm and if you pick the right spot. And it, it's, you don't want to fool around about that. That's a real important decision. And if anybody, like I said before, if anybody has reservations about that and has a piece of land, I'm, I'm more than willing to help them out. And I, Greg Miller and Amy could help you out with that too. And, you know, there's, you're lucky in Ohio because we get some of the top growers in the U.S. are right here, which is uh, uh, certainly Greg's helped me out. I don't think I would have been successful if it wasn't for Greg Miller and the uh, experience that he had. And I just have, I didn't even know him. I just happened to be 70 miles away. And he had a lot of experience with Greg Miller. Did you have another question? The, uh, I always turn buying chestnuts. I always buy I, I couldn't hear you with that car going by. That's I, a rare thing here. I've always bought chestnuts at Kroger's. Yeah. So I use them for, you know, just boiling or roasting. Mm -hmm. The last ones I bought, I took them home and they were full of holes. And so that was the last of my chestnut pie. Yep, that's uh, the chestnut weevil. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they must have, they probably bought locally if they had, if they had weevil problems. But uh, the weevil is kind of the nemesis of the chestnut industry. And 
they can be controlled, uh, and there's there's a few different ways of doing it. Uh, one is to really study their life cycle. They they attack the chestnuts usually sometime in early to mid August. They have a real long proboscis on them where they, they it's like a mouthpiece that comes out. They can actually get down within the among the spines of the on the burr, and they drill a little hole down in there and right just an eighth of an inch above the the, uh, the scar on the chestnut of where it attaches to the burr. They'll drill a little hole in there. When they taste enough meat in there, they'll turn right around, put their ovipositor in there, and they'll lay about three eggs in there. And it's, you can, uh, what, what I do in my chestnut orchard is I go through and split chestnuts on my earliest trees. I'll take a knife, cut right down through the burr, and as soon as I see a nut meat start to form, and it'll be the size of a small pea, or about the size of a pea, it is time to spray, and you can't fool around with it. It's got to be done, like, right now. And if you can do that and keep it on for 20 days, uh, you're done. Your weevil problem is, is over. <coughs> Although, we find that we're getting some that uh, apparently if or evolving around that, maybe coming into the orchard a little bit later. So we're, we're kind of experimenting with that this year to see see what the story is on that. So uh, if you're fresh, you don't have to worry about that, right? You just get a little protein. Yeah, well, if, for some people, yeah, but I, I, my own philosophy on that, the public's tolerance to chestnut weevil is zero. <laughs> and when they see those things crawl out of the nuts, all kinds of terrible thoughts go through their minds about the ones that they just ate. <laughs> and they might never buy them again. So it's, it's pretty critical not to have those in your chestnuts. And I spray mine with a pecan sprayer. There's other ways to do it. And, and honestly, we're right on the fringe. Uh, Amy's dad today is out there with a drone flying over his orchard, testing uh, using uh, drones to fly. And the technology is very close at hand where they'll be able to take drones, program your orchard uh, for that drone so that all it's spraying is just the trees, just the crown of the tree. And that, that's coming. In fact, I envision the day when there will probably be little tiny drones out there flying around that are just spraying the burrs. And this is, it's, it's all possible. And it, if it's possible, uh, it's going to happen. And it's, it's going to happen in our, a lot of our lifetime. We're actually going to see that. At least I sure hope so, because I'm tired of riding this great track and I don't like screening everything when it's not necessary. So if you just have one tree and you don't spray, what's the, isn't there a thing to do right away, like plant? Yeah, if, like yeah, in this, in Ohio, we're far enough north so that we will take some time to develop. And a lot of times, if it's a fairly early tree and you get those nuts off, you can heat treat them. You can, if, if you bring the temperature of that nut up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. Is that right or 123? What is it? 120. 120, okay. Go, go higher. Okay, 120. I stand corrected. It won't even kill the nut, but it will kill the weevil. And a lot of times in the egg stage, so that there is no real visible damage to that nut. And believe me, as long as people don't see them crawling out, <laughs> they're fine with it. They will never know if, if they eat a couple you know, microscopic, you know, weevil instars or whatever. Uh, so that, that's, that is one thing we can, can work on. Yeah, I heard if you put them in the fridge that delays them also, so you got a couple of days to cook them before Yeah, you that's one of the reasons we have this, this cooler here, is that the sooner you get them into cold storage, the better off you're going to be. It drastically slows down the weevil's development. And, uh, so far, we've been pretty lucky on the spray. We've been able to control the weevil real well. Uh, but one of these years, we're going to have a rain episode that goes through one of the spray cycles, and we're going to be in trouble. And that's that's one reason we belong to Route 9 Co-op, because they have down there what we call the nut jacuzzi, which is about almost the size of that table, and double wide. You can take a 1,000 pounds of nuts at a time and put them into this thing. It has two big water heaters on it that heat the water up to 120 degrees and hold it there and it just blows that water through that bin of chestnuts.
puts that temperature up from 120 for 10 or 15 minutes. They take them out of there and let them cool, put them in the cooler, and any weevils that were thinking about getting started in there, they're, they're done for. And that's that's kind of an insurance policy, and a good good reason to belong to a cooler. So for cold storage, what humidity and what temperature? High humidity, the highest humidity possible, really. And the temperature, I really, if you're uh, 40 degrees and lower, I think you're fine. But uh, technically, if you want to storm for a long time, the closer you get to 32 degrees, the better. Uh, but I will warn you, that's going to cost you a lot in a cooler. And secondly, if anything goofs up, you can, if you freeze those, you're done too. So it's, and right now, we, we're in the lap of luxury because we can't hang on to nuts long enough to worry about having a storm break. The market is actually solid enough right now so that they'll eat up every nut that you've got about as fast as you can get them out of the field. Which is, thank God for that. Any, anything else? All right. The farm tour will have a